Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this whole video we're gonna talk about this guy. The big guy, Colonel Russell Williams. Which means we're also going back to Canada. Sorry not sorry. Colonel Russell Williams was exactly that, a high-ranking bigwig in the Canadian Armed Forces. Over the course of his life and career, which we will talk about, he would become a shining star and elite Top Gun pilot in the Canadian military. For a while, and we'll get into that. And we'll also talk about the very nature of this kind of enigmatic person. So let's have a go. Russell Williams was born not in uh, Canada, but in merry old England. So uh, I guess this one's not on you, Canada. We're talking Bromsgrove, people, near Birmingham. The year he was born was 1963 CE, and he was the first child of Cedric and Christine. They moved to Canada while Russell was a baba. He would have a brother, Harvey, born in Canada. Russell Williams' is his daddy, Cedric, though he seemed to go by his middle name Dave, got himself a job at Chalk River Laboratories. Something to do with nukes and shit, I think. Dangerous substances are removed from this flask. By so that was the family. You know, uh, until it wasn't. See, old daddy Dave was a bit of a bastard man to his wife, Christine, leading to their divorce in 1969. But it wasn't just that. See, the Williams family got to know another family in Canada. In the neighborhood, the Savkas, Lynn and Jerry Savka. The Williamses got to know them real well. Wink wink. One of the reasons for the divorce was that Dave was off nuking Lynn Savka. So the Williams family split up. Interestingly, however, uh, Christine ended up marrying Jerry Savka, so they did the old switcheroo. Anyways, Christine Williams became Noni Savka. She used her middle name and moved with her new hubby Jerry and sons Russell and Harvey to Scarborough, Ontario, which would in a couple of years, you know, become Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamalka's stomping ground. Can I ask you a question? But that's another story. Russell would take his stepfather's name of Sovka, but we'll just stick to Williams for now. And he... done. Growed up. As a child, he was well-behaved, shy, polite. He went to high school at Birchmount Collegiate in Toronto delivered the Globe and Mail newspapers, and learned the piano and the trumpet. In 1979, the Savkas, Russell included, moved to South Korea, Jerry having to oversee a nuclear reactor project. Russell returned a year later, enrolling at the boarding school of Upper Canada College. In 1982, Russell went on to study politics and economics at the University of Toronto's Scarborough campus. Around this time, Russell went back to using the Williams surname. At university, it seems that... Guys, get out the violins. Russell was just a tad lonely. You know, his biological dad lived in New York State, while his stepfather and mom, they lived in Hawaii. And this is when some flashes of what Russell will become... come. One thing was that his roommates called him Drill Sergeant. He would keep the place spotless, demand they wear slippers. And he also got a reputation for being a bit of a trickster. He'd prank people all the time. One thing he'd do would pick the locks of other people's rooms, hide in there, and then jump out and scare them. So he learned pretty early and pretty quickly how to, you know, pick the old locks and break into people's homes. It would have been, uh, you know, better off if he didn't learn that. He got himself a girl, though when she broke up with him, he was crushed. Moving swiftly on. So, after earning his degree, finishing up his studies, he remained in Scarborough. He worked part-time at the university, waited tables at Red Lobster, and watched Top Gun again and again and again. Who can blame him? Probably not healthy, though. After turning down a job with the Mounties, Russell Williams joined the Canadian Forces in 1987. These Canadian university students are getting a degree, a salary, and that important first job, all funded by the Canadian Armed Forces. Want a degree in the future? We're under recruiting in the Yellow Pages. It's your choice, your future. That's when his dream became a reality, baby. He got his wings in 1990 and worked as an instructor in Manitoba. 
The next year, he was promoted to captain, and that same year of 1991, he married Mary Elizabeth Harriman at an intimate ceremony. In 1994, Russell was transferred to Ottawa. There, he worked with VIPs, high-ranking government officials, transporting them all around the place. Sure, there he is yapping away with the Queen of England. Over the years, he gradually rose up the ranks in the Canadian forces. Major, Lieutenant Colonel, served as a commanding officer in the Middle East, done all this Air Force shit. He returned to Canada in 2006, and in 2009, he became Colonel Russell Williams. You will salute him. What a guy, what a hero, you know, serving his country until... Yikes. Now, there is a report that during a tour of duty in Dubai in 2005, he developed some kind of a um, chronic back pain and started taking uh, prednisone for it. Prednisone is used to treat a variety of inflammatory and autoimmune diseases, and, at least anecdotally, has been linked to violent behavior. A former co-worker said that Russell had been on strong medications that changed his behavior. Well, it's worth mentioning, but it doesn't exactly explain what he would go on to do and become, uh, uh, let's just get into it. So we got Russell, described as an elite pilot and shining star, Top Gun ain't got shit on him. His wife, Mary Elizabeth, was an associate executive director with the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada, a noble career also. The marriage seemed happy enough, they both enjoyed golfing and gardening, and they had a house in Westboro Village in Ottawa, and things were good. However, during the week, Russell lived alone in their cottage in Tweed, over two hours away from Ottawa. He lived there during the week as the place in Tweed was only 45 minutes from the military base he worked at. This arrangement was probably a uh, bad idea. He had way too much time on his hands. Time he wouldn't um, put to good use. In 2007, he started breaking into homes around Tweed, and he would do the same in 2008 in Ottawa. Why, you ask? Well, I hear you barking, big dog. Let me tell you, because, yeah. To take pictures like this. Obviously, come on, you know yourself like. It seems he would scope out neighbors' homes, and if no one was home, he would enter and steal girls' and women's underwear and other personal items. In one case, he broke into the home of a 12-year-old girl, this was a neighbor, and spent almost three hours taking pictures of himself posing in her underwear and uh, pleasuring himself. In another case, pictures revealed him lying on the bed of a 15-year-old girl, having a big wank and holding a stuffed bear. Yeah, it's, uh, that's fucked, isn't it? He would sometimes leave behind little notes, you know, thank you, one time writing mercy on a girl's computer, so at least he was polite. Many of Russell's uh, victims were unaware he had even broken in, and sometimes he would do it to the same house more than once. Gross. Burn that shit down. So he would do this a lot, over 60 times and take a lot of these pictures. It burned into my mind, so now it has to be burned into yours. Yeah, remember how I said he would break into places, uh, you know, that were, that were unoccupied, empty houses, you know, when people were out and about? Um, well, him breaking into empty houses would go out the window just like he would go in the window. His first victim was asleep in her tweed home with her infant daughter. When he broke in, bound and blindfolded her, fondled her, and took pictures of her while she was naked. Two weeks later, he broke into the home of another woman, punched her in the head, and did the same as he did to the previous victim. In November 2009, Russell broke into a home near Belleville, about 30 minutes from Tweed. He stole a shitload of lingerie, a freaking porno video, and a sex toy. He then left a message on the owner's computer, daring her to call the police, and said that the judge would enjoy seeing her dildo. Probably not as much as Russell enjoyed seeing her dildo. So, however, you know, here we are seeing, like, escalation, right? It would start off with just breaking in, and then stealing things, and then attacking people. It was going up and up and up, and that escalation would continue to escalate. 
To keep his flight status as a pilot active, Russell flew at least once a month, usually in an Airbus A310. 38-year-old Corporal Marie France Como worked as a flight attendant on many of these flights. In late November 2009, she missed a work shift after returning home from a trip to India, a work trip to India. When her boyfriend popped by her home to see what was up, he found her body. See, Russell, as her commander, basically had access to all of her information. When she was in India, Russell broke into her home. He rummaged through her stuff, took pictures, stole lingerie, all the usual stuff. You know, the Russell classics. When she returned from India, she noticed and blamed her boyfriend, who obviously denied it. Then, a couple of days later, he broke in again. This time, he hid in the basement and was planning on waiting till she went to sleep. However, when she went looking for one of her cats, she entered the basement and saw the cat staring at Russell. She didn't see his face as it was covered, and before she could do anything, he beat her multiple times with a flashlight. When she was unconscious, he wrapped her face with duct tape and tied her to a pole. He then began recording himself beating and sexually assaulting her, at one point even bringing in more lamps as the lighting wasn't quite up to his standard. After two hours, he placed a piece of duct tape over her nose and watched her suffocate. He then cleaned up the scene and went to work. The wing obviously is a community uh, unto itself, but uh, it can't be very successful without being closely connected to the communities that surround it. Uh, that's uh, been clear to me as, as a very important element to develop. And that was his first murder. He would stop breaking into places uh, for a little bit until January 2010 came around. 27-year-old Jessica Lloyd lived alone on rural Highway 37, which runs from Tweed to Belleville, Russell's stomping grounds. On the 29th of January 2010, she failed to show up for work as an administrator for a school bus line. Her family were quickly alerted and they rushed to her home. In the driveway, they found her purse, her glasses, but no Jessica. A missing persons investigation began, and the officers noticed two things. One was footprints in Jessica's back garden, and another was quite distinctive tire treads near her place. A search began. It actually included personnel and search and rescue aircraft from CFB Trenton, authorized by Colonel Russell Williams. And so, being the main lead to go on, the Ontario Provincial Police began conducting extensive canvassing of all motorists using Highway 37, which ran by her home, hoping to find a match to those tire treads. And they did. No prizes for guessing who was driving the car. The tire treads were from a Nissan Pathfinder, to be exact. During the stop, Russell was like, ah, uh, guys, don't look, you know, too close. I got, I got a sick kid. I kind of got to go. Uh, can we hurry this up? Maybe, you know, uh, don't look too closely. Kid, real sick. So when they matched the tire treads to his car, he was put under surveillance. And then suspicion only grew when the police, you know, pretty quickly realized he didn't have any kids. On the 7th of February 2010, Russell Williams was brought in for questioning. He walked in wearing the same boots he had worn to uh, Jessica's place which is probably not a good idea. But, uh, he thought he could talk his way out of it. Hey, I'm cool, I'm just one of you guys. Colonel Russell Williams, pleased to meet you. Well, let's see. You just have a seat there, Russell. The guy I was speaking with on whatever night that was, was Russ as well. Oh, yeah. And he took, uh, took every number I had. Yeah, now they were uh, doing some pretty thorough interviews that night. So. Yeah, absolutely, I was All good. Right. glad to see you. I'm um, just going to move your gloves here. That's a little microphone, just okay. to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. Check. Uh, you ever been interviewed by the police in a, in a room like this before? I or? have never been interviewed like this. Oh, no? Okay. No. Let's get this set up here. You know, obviously our approach to cases like this is that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm -hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So. Um, because of that, we're treating uh, Jessica's case uh, as an emergent situation, obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're fast-forwarding 
things that we might normally take our time with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, sure. So uh, again, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, we're going to do a pretty thorough interview today. Okay. okay? Um, and the reason for that is because uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things and mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you. Okay. okay? Probably have it a little bit. Sorry, what, sorry? Gum. Just oh, okay. piece, piece of gum. <laughs> well, there's napkins there if you want to toss it or whatever. I appreciate that. So I want to explain to you exactly what's going on here, okay? Um, uh, Jessica uh, Lloyd is, um, is one of uh, four cases that we're currently investigating, okay? Right. Um, and essentially what's happened is over the past uh, uh, about four or five months, yeah. um, there have been four occurrences, that, like I said, that we're looking into. Mm. Uh, two of those occurrences occurred in September of 2009, yeah. um, and very briefly, they were up in the uh, the Tweed area. Yeah. Uh, they involved uh, somebody entering uh, two different women's houses mm -hmm. um, in the evening hours and uh, committing uh, sexual acts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in uh, November of 2009, yeah. uh, a young lady by the name of uh, Marie France uh, Como, um, yeah. yeah, was found uh, murdered in her home in Brighton. Yeah. And um, we believe that there was a sexual uh, component to that crime as well. Okay. And um, then, most recently, we have Jessica Lloyd's disappearance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So essentially, when you're looking at those kind of crimes, we're looking at a number of different uh, potential criminal charges. All right. Um, we're looking at issues uh, all the way from the most serious one, which is first-degree murder, mm -hmm. uh, kidnapping, uh, sexual assault, mm -hmm. uh, break and enter with intent to commit sexual assault, yeah. um, forcible confinement. Okay. And uh, so what I want to make sure you understand, and this is what we've been doing with everybody we've been talking to, is that clearly when we find out who's responsible for one or all of those crimes, yeah. uh, they could be charged with one or all of those offenses, okay? Whether it's you or whether it's anybody else, all right? Is there any reason you want to call a lawyer now? Nope. Okay. He stuck to a plan, be cooperative, blah, 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 give them whatever they want, casual-like. The police had linked Jessica Lloyd's disappearance to the murder of Marie France Como. You know, you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of uh, make us want to talk to, to Russell Williams, okay? Because mm -hmm. um, essentially, uh, there was a, a, a connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Would you agree? Geographically, and then I guess or... I drive past, uh, yes, I, I would yes. have to say there is a, a connection, yeah. So the next thing we need to cover off is, uh, well, I'll just ask you this straight out. Uh, given the types of crimes we're investigating, uh, do you get much chance to uh, to watch television shows, CSI, things like that? I do watch, uh, I prefer Law & Order, but I do watch CSI occasionally, yes. Okay. So you have an idea of, obviously, the forensic capabilities, things like mm -hmm. that are out there. What would you be willing to give me today to help me um, move past you in this investigation? What uh, what do you need? Well, um, would you be willing to supply things like fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, footwear impressions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's what we're gonna we're gonna ask you to do. Okay. All right. So, when questioned about this, Russell said, "You know, on the twenty fourth of November, the night Marie Franz Como died, he was out dining with the misses. My wife and I had dinner because she was here for work, and then I headed back." Okay. Um, well, that's, these are the kind of things that I'm trying to draw out here. That's helpful to us. Um, do you remember where you had dinner? <laughs> uh, well, I don't remember exactly the restaurant, but it was in Westboro because that's where our house was being built at the time. So we had dinner, you know, in a restaurant that we would expect to be able to frequent uh, once the house was finished. Okay. Remember how you paid? Uh, one of us would have paid by MasterCard. Yeah. Okay. Are, are you sure about that? or? Pretty sure. That's normally how we uh, okay. we pay for meals. All right. Can't and remember if it was me or my wife that paid, but one of us. Okay. And do you remember which restaurant it was again? No. Okay. All right. And you see where I'm getting at, right? I mean, th that can be very helpful for us because yeah. if we can track yeah. uh, that issue, right? Uh, oh, yeah. We can we can put somebody paying for a, a meal at a, at a location. Well, I was meeting with uh, you know 15 people or so that day. So. Okay. And what time did the meeting end? I would say between three and four. Okay. And um, are you sure that that's the same day you went out with your wife? Well, I think so. Yeah, because she was here and... Uh... 
However, when the police began to show him the evidence they had linking him to Jessica Lloyd, the footprints on tire tracks, well. Can I assume you're going to be discreet? It's possible, yeah. Because, uh, you know, this would have a very significant impact on the base if they thought you thought I did this. Because it's tough to undo the rumor mill once it gets started. Let me explain you when I'm getting out here, Russell, okay? Um, what kind of tires do you have on your Pathfinder? I think, um, I think they're Toyo. Okay. Do you know the brand name, or sorry, the uh, I think make? Is, uh, um, I don't know. Sorry, the, the make is Toyo. Yeah. I don't know the model. Okay. Let's see, I'll write, read this off to you, see if it rings a bell. Ever heard of, uh, does Toyo Open Country HTS? That sounds Make any right. sense? Yeah. Okay. The tires that you have on your truck, right? The reason I asked you about that is there, is there any time, I mean, uh, you recall uh, where you were stopped um, by the officers there? Yes. Okay. Did they explain to you what the significance so of that was? That was her house. That was her house. Yeah. Okay. So you remember that location? Yep. Yeah. Do you remember what the crossroad was or? I don't think there was a crossroad. It's sort of just uh, on the south end of 37. Okay. Um, when you get stopped at that location, has there been a time in the recent uh, one or two weeks that uh, your vehicle has uh, left that road for any reason whatsoever? Have you driven into a field with your vehicle at all um, for any reason you can think of? No. Okay. Because um, I want you to rack your brain here. This is important. So yeah, yeah. Is there anything you can remember doing that, uh, you know, would have caused you to, to uh, drive off the road no. at that section of roadway? Would it surprise you to know that uh, when the CSI officers were uh, looking around uh, her property uh, that they identified um, a set of tire tracks uh, to the north of her property? Um, looks as if the vehicle left the road mm -hmm. and uh, drove along the north tree line of, of uh, Jessica Lloyd's property. Okay. okay. Um, they took, uh, they examined those tire tracks. Mm -hmm. They identified those tires as the same uh, tires on your Pathfinder. Really? Yeah. What happened uh, the night of Jessica Lloyd's murder was this. He had seen her exercising on a treadmill in her basement while out on one of his runs. On the 28th of January, well, he returned, breaking into her home at 1am on the 29th. He blindfolded her with duct tape and bound her hands with rope. For three hours, he sexually assaulted her. Then, he took her to his cottage in Tweed, where the torture would continue for another 21 hours, including getting her to pose for photos. Finally, after reassuring her that he would not kill her, he clubbed Jessica with his flashlight and strangled her. He left her body in the garage and went to work. He then would come back, retrieve her body, and dump it somewhere else. After almost five hours, Russell began to break. I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect, and I've asked you to do the same for me. Um, we talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, uh, approached you here, okay? Uh, the, the trying to be as discreet as possible, mm -hmm. okay? But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? And it's not issues that point away from you, it's issues that point at you, okay? And I want I want you to see what I mean, mm -hmm. all right? This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house. Mm -hmm on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January, yeah. okay? These are identical. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Okay, you want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is, this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. Hmm.
this is getting beyond my control. All right, I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house and I need to know why. Well, I don't know what to say. That's, um... Well, you need to explain it. Because okay? don't get me wrong, I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety, got off on it got off on having that label, Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. Russell. What are we going to do? Call me Russ, please. Okay. It's hard to believe this is not. My only two immediate concerns from a perception perspective are what my wife must be going through right now. Yeah. And the impact this is going to have on the Canadian forces. What do you want to talk about? It's uh, pretty wide open now. Right? Yeah. What do you want to know? Well, do you want to work forwards or backwards? Doesn't matter. Why don't we start with Jessica? Okay. How does that start for you? Um, I saw her in her house on her treadmill. When the police searched the couple's Ottawa home following his arrest, they found a pillowcase in the garage and multiple computer boxes in the basement. And Russell, knowing the jig was up, led the police to Jessica Lloyd's body. So where is she? Get him out. Um, is she close to where she lives? I've got maps of that general area. Which town is she near? Why don't we start there? He later wrote a note to his wife. Dearest Mary Elizabeth, I love you, sweet something. I am so very sorry for having to hurt you like this. I know you'll take good care of sweet Rosie. That's the cat. I love you, Russ. This was, well, news to Mary Elizabeth. Um, you know, who would later be accused actually of knowing exactly what Russell was up to, breaking and entering and killing people. She would deny it, obviously, saying she had no idea. She allegedly knew nothing about his activities, and he was very careful to hide, you know, any any evidence he took, any things he had, he, he had stolen. He would keep even, like, uh, pictures in folders, and within folders, within folders on a computer, like, hoping, you know, she wouldn't find out, like, it's your porn stash. And he would also have a spreadsheet, you know, with the dates and locations of places he'd broken into. He was very organized. I'll give him that. When the police searched the Tweed Cottage, they even found recordings taped to the back of the piano. Russell appeared before the Ontario Court of Justice on July 22, 2010. Russell Williams was placed on suicide watch after he tried to kill himself by wedging a stuffed cardboard toilet paper roll down his throat, which is what a way to go. This didn't work. And after his aborted suicide attempt and a short-lived hunger strike, which he stopped when he just got hungry, he remained in solitary confinement under 24-hour watch. The details that were out already didn't prepare anyone for what was heard in court today. As Colonel Russell Williams pleaded guilty to two murders, two sexual assaults and more than 80 break-ins. And many were described in detail. Along with each count came graphic photo evidence and a clear pattern to Williams' escalating crimes. On the 18th of October 2010, Russell pled guilty to all charges before the Ontario Superior Court of Justice. Russell Williams was sentenced to two life terms for the murder of Marie France Como and Jessica Lloyd 
and another 120 years for other crimes. He is now in solitary confinement at a maximum security prison in Kingston, Ontario. He'll be eligible for parole in 2035, at the age of 72. Now, Russell is one strike short of being a serial killer, something the FBI defines as like tree murders with a cooling off period in between, although some other definitions say two or more. So, I guess he could be a serial killer. Depends on your definition. Why do you think these things happen? Hmm. Have you spent much time thinking about that? About why? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know the answers. And I'm pretty sure the answers don't matter. Russell doesn't fit any models that could account for what he did. He was significantly older than most serial killers are at the time of his first kill. He was successful and accomplished, had no red flags growing up, but within the space of two years, he went from fetish burglar to murderer who would have killed again if he hadn't been caught. Apparently, during one of his assaults, Russell reportedly told his victim that he was attacking her so that he could, quote, move on with his life. What he meant by that, only former Colonel Russell Williams knows. Though whatever he was, well, he was a sexual sadist, he knew everything he was doing. He was smart, he was able to control his urges, avoid detection, had self-control, and worst of all, a complete lack of empathy for his victims. So I think it's only fair we share the same lack of empathy when he was stripped of his rank and all honors, his uniform burned, and his decorations destroyed. With the conviction conferred by the court, the game forces are now able to take action, including the prompt release of Russell Williams from the armed forces, the termination and clawback of his pay from the date of arrest, the removal of his medals, and all other measures available to us. Though he still gets his $60,000 annual military pension. Not sure how much use he'll have for that in prison. In 2012, the Canadian Defence Minister had to apologise after a booklet was distributed. With, guess whose mug was on it? Another thing is that some neighbours of Russell's Tweed Cottage wanted it destroyed, well, after the horrific torture of Jessica Lloyd happened there. But, another neighbour ended up buying it. Weirdly enough, uh, something about the new owners. The daughter of the family was his first victim. He snuck into her bedroom when the family was out of town and stole six pairs of her underwear. She was 12 years old at this time, but the family who were buying you know, Russell Williams' old torture chamber, they say, hey, in this market, a house is a house. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Take care of yourselves. Mike out.